Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. My name is Elise Benin. I'm one of the programming partners for How Design Live. I'm also the owner of marketing-mentor.com. And this is the How Marketing Live track. And the idea behind this, if no one has told you yet, is that design and marketing are coming closer and closer together and things are getting more and more complicated and the two parties need to be able to speak to and understand okay. each other's language. So we're coming at it from very different angles all day long, today and tomorrow, and hopefully it's making some sense. Is it working so far? Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Michael Solomon, PhD, is a professor of marketing in the Haub School of Business at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. He's also an industry consultant and an author. In fact, Michael wrote the book on understanding consumers, literally. His book, Consumer Behavior, Buying, Having, and Being, is the most widely used book on the subject in the world. That's why I thought he would be good to speak here. And that's also why I said yes when he suggested himself to me as a guest on my podcast a couple of years ago. And since then, we've actually been recording several episodes. So what is Michael most proud of? He says right now his son, he's getting ready to finish his training at Tufts Medical School here in Boston. Then he will be fully qualified to be a heart surgeon. And finally, as he likes to remind him, we'll have a real doctor in the family, not just a PhD. And what is he most excited about? He said this is a really exciting time to be studying consumer behavior. So I'm sure he's going to tell you all about that. Please welcome Michael Solomon to the How Marketing Live stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you all for coming. I'm, I'm a little intimidated because I think I'm the only thing standing between you and the bar, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> So I, yeah, I'm feeling a little pressure, but uh, I'll do my best to tap dance and keep everybody awake. So um, let, me start, let me start with a story. And the story is that uh, some years ago, I was working for, uh, as a consultant for a big ad agency in New York, and the client was a very large uh, personal care products company, uh, primarily made women's products. You would know it if I told you the name, but then I'd have to shoot you, so I can't, I can't tell you the name. But um, we wanted to, uh, to, to learn more about their core customer. And so I started by going around and talking to some of the brand managers and to some of the account people at the agency, and I said, tell me about your customer. You know, who, who is she? What makes her tick? And so on. And uh, pretty much to a person, they all said to me, well, you know, she's, she's in her 20s. She's very cosmopolitan. Um, she's, uh, you know, she goes out to clubs every night. You guys, you get the picture, right? You know, she's kind of this, this glam, you know, sex in the city type. Then I dig into some of the data, which apparently they hadn't been looking at you know, about who was actually buying this particular product, which is still very much on the market today. And it turns out that when you look at the actual data, the, the picture's a bit different because the, the heavy user of this particular product is basically a woman in her 50s. She's single, she lives alone, and um, she has a lot of cats. Uh, what we call the Blanche Dubois profile. So obviously, the picture that all of these people had in their mind of their customer was quite distorted. And it turns out that this is a fairly typical kind of thing because we often sell to the customer we, we want to have. And everybody wants that woman on the left, and nobody on the left, yeah, on the left, and nobody wants that woman on the right necessarily. So that particular lesson really underscored for me the, the importance of understanding your customers. And I think it's very important for all of you guys who are in the design world to, to really take that to heart. Because uh, in order to be able to design for your customer, you need to understand your customer, right? You can't design for the customer you want to have. You've got to design for the customer that you have. And uh, you know that, that obviously presents some challenges. And today, one of the biggest challenges is very simple but really complicated at the same time. When you're designing for people and when, especially when you're marketing what you've made to those people, 
the first thing you've got to do is get their attention. And many of you know that this is not nearly as easy as it sounds because all of us are living in a state of information overload, information saturation. Um, everybody's on their phones. I, uh, how's your Facebook post, by the way, down there? Yeah, that's great. Um, everybody's doing you know, lots of different things at a time. And brands are bombarding us with messages. And so when you look at the media environment, and you look at how formidable it is just to get noticed, it's, it's really, really daunting. So um, let, me, let me ask you a question, you guys. How, how many, just take a guess, in a typical day in the Western world, how many commercial messages is the typical consumer exposed to, whether it's on billboards or you know, pop-up ads, whatever, radio ads, whatever it is? Uh, it's, it's an awful lot. It's an awful lot. Do you think it's more than 50? Yes. Yeah, OK. Do you think it's more than 500? Yes. You do? Yes. Wow. No, I see some people saying, no way. Well, the answer is, is 1,000? No. no, actually, it's not. Because the answer is more than 5,000. Surprise. The answer is more than 5,000 a day. Now, does that mean that we notice 5,000 messages in a day? Obviously not. We notice a very, very small percentage of those. And so if your message, your product, your package, what have you, is not making it through that aperture, then I don't care how great your ad campaign is, I don't care how beautiful the, your color palette is for your package and all that stuff, it's totally off the table for, for consumers. So the biggest challenge, I think, the biggest creative challenge, easy for me to say because I'm not a creative, you guys are, but the biggest challenge is simply to break through the clutter and to engage consumers. And when I talk to people in marketing all across the spectrum, they use different words, but basically what they're saying is, we have consumers who are just so frazzled that we can't get them to sit down long enough and ponder how wonderful our brand really is. So we really are competing in what's been called an eyeball economy. You may have heard that term. You may have heard the term attention economy. Really means the same thing. What it means is that we're competing not so much for dollars, although we like to get those as well, but we're competing for the eyeballs of our consumers. And the, the large majority of brands, organizations, are losing that race very simply because they are not breaking through and motivating people to put down their phones long enough to really think about how beautiful this work of art that you call your product really is. So obviously, it would be good to do some marketing research, you would think. You know, that's why I guess you're, you're allied here with the AMA, right, to, to push the idea that it's good to know your customers. But on the other hand, in the design world, I think there's maybe some pushback about doing that. So we, uh, you all know this, this guy, this genius, um, uh, Steve Jobs. And uh, you know, he, he said, some people say, give customers what they want, but that's not my approach. I think Henry Ford once said, if I'd asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never rely on market research. Our task is to read things that are not yet on the page. You, many of you have seen this quote before, and it's a, it's a great way to justify cutting marketing research out of a company's budget, right? Uh, it's also really not true, and uh, I think it reflects a certain misunderstanding. Who am I to criticize a genius? Uh, but in this case, if you'll indulge me, I think that, that what Mr. Jobs was doing was actually confusing two very important things. He's correct in saying that, that nobody would have you know, sat down in 1975 and sketched out an iPhone in a focus group you know, and said, that's what I want. But we're not claiming that. When we talk about the importance of doing marketing research and of understanding your customers, Nobody is claiming that customers can see into the future, most of them. Maybe he, he could to some extent, but he was very, very unique. So really what's happening is that I think 
we have a confusion between two very different things, and that's what we call features versus benefits. So features are the things that you all build into your products. You know, they're the attributes, they're the miles per gallon, or what the, you know, what the desk is made out of, and that sort of thing. But consumers don't buy features. Consumers buy benefits. So, uh, you know, there's a time-worn expression and uh, cliche in marketing that, that a company makes a three-quarter inch drill bit, but a consumer buys a three-quarter inch hole. And that is a really, really crucial distinction because what it means is that those consumers may, may have told Apple what they wanted, not in terms of the physical form of that iPhone, but rather they know what they want in terms of the benefits, in terms of ease of communication and you know, being able to uh, see their loved ones on a screen or you're just connecting with their loved ones, things like that. They may not know the exact product form that's gonna take, but we're not expecting them to know that. We want to get beneath the surface and find out not what are the features that they want, but rather what are the benefits that they want. And I can't stress enough how different those two, they're obviously related, but they're very, very different from each other. So, uh, you know, a company like Harley Davidson, for example, understands that. You know, if you, look at, if you look at an ad like this, what you see is it says at the bottom, stop dreaming, you know, so here's, Here's this kind of a sad uh, picture, I guess, but here's this, this guy who's working as an orderly in an, in an old age home. Uh, but his experience is different because what he's dreaming about, presumably, is being on his Harley after work. So the lived experience of the consumer is what a company like Harley is selling. You know, the features have to do with the motorcycles themselves, but the, ve the benefits are very, very different. So, um, so for example, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you a moment about a big company you may have heard of called DuPont. Uh, I worked, I, I had the opportunity to do a lot of work with DuPont. And one of the things that, that we worked on, I, I thought was very interesting because here we have a product. Now DuPont back in the day made fibers. They actually don't make fibers anymore, but they were very big in the textiles business. And one of the products that they made was something like this. So here you have a pair of pantyhose that I think many women you know, cringe at, at wearing. But it's not just any pair of pantyhose because what they, what they saw was that, that uh, they're selling a pair of pantyhose but it's actually a benefit delivery system. And the reason I say that is that these pantyhose have micro encapsulated fibers in them that actually can release various kinds of uh, vitamins and other things like that, that literally change, uh, that, that get absorbed by the body. So what you're seeing here is it, it turns out that if you want to get rid of cellulite, caffeine is what gets rid of cellulite. It's something I learned when I worked with that. Now, that doesn't mean you take a cup of coffee and, you know, <laughs> but if you take caffeine, at least in a certain way, and you actually apply it to the skin, it smooths out the skin. So, if you've learned nothing else, we can stop right there, you know. Uh, but so the point is that, that they're selling this pair of pantyhose, but actually what these women are buying is uh, a reduction in, in cellulite. And that, that really impacted me quite a bit. And so, you know, when I was working with them, I want to tell you a quick story about how we go from, from um, attributes or features to, to benefits. So I'll call this the tale of the smelly socks. So what happened was DuPont came to me and they said, look, we, we have rocket scientists here who can make any kind of fiber that you want. And in fact, they've won Nobel Prizes for the various things that they've made, like, like Lycra and uh, Kevlar and things like that. The problem is that we don't think about what consumers want. We just send these guys to their laboratories, they make this great stuff, and then we say, okay, what can we do with it? So we'd like to try to change that perspective and we'd like you to help us. So this, I can assure you, was like turning a battleship and it was a multi-year project that we did. But essentially we started with the idea that uh, they had um, bought some research, some very large scale research, global research, that showed that one of the megatrends, you've probably heard that term, one of the megatrends that people were looking for around the world was the idea of freshness. People wanted things that they bought to be fresh. So they said, okay, we wanna make, 
we want to make fibers that help people to be fresh. So how do we do that? Well, the engineers, I was on a task force. It was me and about 30 engineers and chemists. Really uh, a love fest. And um, so all the engineers said, well, that's simple. Because it turns out that people, you know, when people say freshness, what they mean is they don't want stinky stuff. They don't want smelly stuff. And we know how to do that. We can make a certain fiber that, that removes the perspiration from the body, and that's what, causes, that's what causes odor. So when you have smelly socks, we can solve that particular uh, problem. So when we look at the issue of how can we get fibers that, that will deliver this benefit of freshness in DuPont's value chain, well, the answer is simple. We make these socks, and you can buy these socks you know, all over the place. Many of you probably, if you're runners or something, you probably use them. But I said, now wait a second. Let's, let's not jump at this too fast because maybe freshness has other meanings as well to people. Have you ever asked anyone what it means to be fresh? Well, why would we have to ask them? We're engineers, we know everything, right? So this started this, this long project. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about it, but basically we went on a worldwide quest to define other possible meanings of freshness that consumers have and then think about how can we work backwards now to create products that they're capable of engineering that will deliver on, on that value. So we did all kinds of focus groups and other things like that in major markets around Europe and, and the US. Um, and it turns out that one of the things you want to do, and as designers, I think many of you realize that the imp one of the really big uh, things in marketing today is what we call sensory marketing and the, the recognition that it's not just the visual channel that consumers use to, you know, to perceive products. If the visual channel is crowded, as we've already seen it is, well, maybe you can break through on another channel, like, like sound. You know, the session that was just in here was about music and marketing, like sense and various things like that. So we looked at, at freshness in terms of how consumers think about it using their different senses. And we go through this, this process and um, we basically give people lots of pictures to look at, which is what marketers like to do sometimes. And, and you give them all these pictures and you say, okay, pick out the pictures that to you are, are most representative of the concept, what freshness means to you. And these are, and they, we use them in different categories like emotions and landscapes, people, activities, and so on. These are some of the uh, images that were most likely to be chosen by men and women around the world, or at least here in Europe, um, that represent freshness. And you can see that, that not all of them have to do with odor, like smelly socks, right? So it's, it's visual, it might be tactile, uh, it's emotional, and, and so on. And, uh, in fact, this image was the most popular image overall chosen by men and women to represent freshness. Now, I looked at this and said, wait a second, you know, I, um, I had babies, well, my wife did, but I, I was there, and um, they don't smell too fresh to me, you know? Uh, well, it turns out what they had in mind, and by the way, men would look at this picture in focus groups and tears would come to their eyes. Oh, this baby is so, you know, fresh. And of course, what they're thinking about is Johnson Johnson baby powder, which is the quintessential odor, it turns out, that represents freshness. So, okay. So we go through this process, skip fast forward three years or so. <laughs> Um, and we find that really what people, when people talk about freshness, not the engineers, but real people, what they mean is that something is unused or you're returning it to an original state of goodness or purity or innocence. So freshness kind of means innocence in that sense, right? Uh, so what we need is to find a fabric delivery system that restores a garment to its original state. In other words, makes it as if it had never been worn before. Now that's a little different than you know, just reducing odors. So we go through this whole uh, process where we find that uh, we can create, or they can create, I don't know how they do it, uh, a, a so-called memory fiber that, uh, that is wrinkle resistant and returns, so in other words, you stretch it out and it returns back to its original condition. Now, it turns out that DuPont conveniently makes something like that. It's called Lycra. Uh, the generic term is spandex. Many of you have it if you're wearing jeans or something. You, 
you have some of that in your genes. So lycra is a memory fiber. And anyway, skipping ahead, based on that insight now, rather than focusing on making antimicrobial socks, we're able to steer them into other directions that they never would have, have gone before. So this is one um, that, uh, ladies, if you wear leather pants, you know that if you wear, they're expensive, right? But if you wear them, they get stretched out and baggy. But now you put lycra into them, and they revert to their original shape. And so this was one of the applications that came out of our work with DuPont. Um, and so the moral, I guess, is you know, don't have engineers take their socks off or anything like that, because that's really what they're going to focus on. So you guys talk a lot about design thinking. That's the big mantra I know in, in your field. And uh, when you look at design thinking, you know that the first part of it is called empathize, right? I hope that looks familiar to many of you. So what I want to focus on is this notion of empathy in, in terms of how we as marketers are going to take the perspective of our, of our customers. So the ability to step into the shoes of other people, to see the world as they do, not as you the manager or you the designer. And that's what we need to do in order to just even start this whole process of design thinking. Okay, so let's Talk about marketing 101 then. In marketing 101, how do we get, uh, how do we get an advantage over the competition? Because they're all trying to do the same thing. Well, what we do is we identify our competitive advantage. In other words, what are we good at that they're not? And we, we're not good, nobody's good at everything. Even Apple you know, is not good at everything. So you identify that, and then you leverage it. Right there, marketing 101, okay, hit the bar. We're done, you know. Um, now it's easy, easier said than done, right? But once you identify that, easy, easier said than done, now you take it to town and you do everything that you can to leverage that competitive advantage. So design is a competitive advantage. It's not just pretty. I think you all, you all know that. Um, so I have a friend, you, may, you probably know him, some of you, uh, Karim Rashid. He's an industrial designer, uh, very interesting guy. Um, we've worked together off and on over the years. And he's designed, these are all products that, that Kareem has designed. And basically, these are all functional products. Many of them, you, can buy, you buy them at Target and so on. They just do everyday stuff, but they just look better while they're doing it than the other products that are there. And that's why he's been so successful at pushing his particular aesthetic, right? So in this sense, form is function. You know, my students, Many of them buy, like Method, right? The reason they like Method cleaners is not that it gets their anything cleaner, but they look better. So that's Method's competitive advantage, and they knew that from the start when they began to design their packages and so on. Bad design is the opposite, right? So this, to me, you guys are the experts, but this is terrible design because this looks like, you know, Red Bull or so, I don't know what it is, but it's radiator coolant. So it's sending a, you know, am I right? It's sending a totally different, you know, wrong message, I, I think, to people. Unless they're people you don't like or something. Okay, so how do we get our consumers to be engaged and how do we get them to think about our product and how it might satisfy their needs. So we know that consumer engagement, as I said, is the single biggest challenge that marketers are facing. One of my favorite cartoons here. Reality TV, uh, many of you probably realize this is an oxymoron. There's nothing real about reality TV. Most, I hate to burst your bubble, most of it's scripted and totally fake. But, uh, but people, the point is that people, um, who are into reality TV are really engaged with reality TV, right? They, you know, they're gonna watch that stuff 24 seven. I have a lot of students who did, do that while I'm lecturing, so I know. Um, and, and so if we can simulate that, I don't know if we can ever get to that point of obsession, but we can probably get close. And you guys have many tools in your toolbox that can, that can help get us there. So, so in business, we talk about ROI. What's the ROI on this? In marketing, that's all we hear these days. What's the ROI, especially from the accounting people? What's the ROI on your advertising budget? So we, we've been conditioned to learn that that's everything. But is it, is it really? Is that focus maybe a bit short-sighted? So I think that it is, because 
I'd like to propose that there's a different metric that we want to use, a different kind of ROI that I call return on involvement. So involving your customers is really the key to eventually maximizing that other kind of ROI. So if we're going to do that, we have to think of strategies that are going to engage consumers who are tuning out our traditional messages and getting them to the point where they're going to watch us as much as they watch you know, the Kardashians or someone like that. But you might say, well, my product is boring. How can I get people to engage in that? You know? and, and I think that that's just not true. Um, so you take a product like water, right? I mean, what can be more boring than water? So here's a, here's a quick um, snippet from a campaign that was done in France for a bottled water company. And, and you can see that they're linking the water to higher order needs. you get the idea. Let's see if they have that in the exhibit hall tonight. I don't, I don't know. But so engagement, engagement is the path to ROI. When, and when you talk to executives, they'll tell you that, uh, for example, according to the economists, uh, most of them say that if their consumers were more engaged, they believe they'd get higher profits. And they blame inadequate engagement for a loss of sales. A lot of them do this. It's clearly something that's a big problem. Uh, Gallup similarly talks about uh, uh, the growth of uh, share of wallet, for example, by consumers who are fully engaged. Uh, another big company, Forrester Research, is starting to develop metrics around measuring engagement and different ways that you can talk about in engagement and how do you quantify that. So it's becoming recognized that engagement is a major issue. And so we've had to change how we think about branding and, and branding theory. So for example, uh, in the old days, we think about brands as assets that the firm controls and creates. Today, I like to think of brands as co-created entities that is co-created between the brand and the consumers who often help to define the meaning of that brand. We used to think that brands exist in the minds of our customers, but I think it's better to think about brands that live in culture. So a brand becomes a cultural phenomenon, and people tap into that collectively if you're successful. We used to measure what brands mean to people, but today what we want to do, I think, is talk about how brands come to mean. That is, the process that occurs over time whereby a brand becomes so central to what people are thinking about and how they think about themselves. So when we talk about involvement, in marketing we talk about a continuum. So at one end of it is every marketer's nightmare, which is inertia, where consumers are totally disengaged. And at the other end, we talk about a flow state, where consumers get so involved in a product experience that they lose track of where they are. And so you know, kids who play video games for 24 hours a day they're experiencing a flow state. So uh, we have various cult brands that are high on the spectrum of, of involvement, the continuum, like the Boston Red Sox. I should say the Phillies, but here I am in Boston. Um, we have, again, Apple. We have, you know, whenever people are lining up around the block to buy a phone that could be delivered by UPS in two days, hello, you know, uh, we know that they're pretty involved. But even, even insignificant brands, take this little candy called a Peeps, right? Everybody knows Peeps. You know, this little piece of marshmallow that's really bad for you. Well, 
that has cultural significance. When you look at what people, I don't know if you realize this, there's cults of people who, who do terrible things to peeps and they post them <laughs> online and you can find all kinds of pictures of you know, crazy ways that they have, like Justin Peeper over here, um, or even this guy, you know. Uh, you might recognize him. So it doesn't have to be a product like your Nike or your Apple, right? Uh, so when we link to higher order needs, we want to go up this pyramid where we start with at the bottom with what we think of as sensation, just the sensory impact of, a, of the brand. We're going to go up to cognition, which is thinking about the brand, then to an emotional reaction, and finally to what we call resonance. So resonance is the holy grail, all right? And uh, for those of you that went to design school, you probably uh, read Donald Norman. Um, his levels of design are somewhat similar to what I'm talking about. So his reflective uh, level is similar, somewhat similar to, to resonance. So brand resonance refers to how a brand's meanings reverberate across the culture and really become part of the consumer's life. That's what creates brand strength and brand value. Uh, lots of different approaches kind of are similar. Mill, uh, Millward Brown is a big marketing research company. They talk about these various uh, categories. It's fairly simple, similar, and you can see that bonding is at the top, which is like resonance. So everybody's got different vocabulary basically to describe the same thing. So uh, here, is, here is a message that focuses on sensation, for example, just the softness of the bread. Very nice. Cognition. Uh, you guys would call it usability, right? So usability basically is how people are uh, interacting with the product and using it, et cetera. Emotion, getting an emotional reaction. This is from an actual study on Dove bars where somebody draws a picture of a, of a Dove bar user and it says, I'll kill everyone in the store in front of me if, if, they, if they don't move it. I need a Dove bar now, right? That is an emotional reaction. Um, but resonance at the top is something more profound than that. So it's the goodness of fit between what people are looking for in their lives and what your brand can give them, okay? Um, and, and there you have a fusion between the brand and the person's identity so that the person and the brand literally become the same. And over time, maybe they even start to look the same. I don't, I don't know. So there's different ways to think about, there's different kinds of fusion. Uh, for example, interdependency. Uh, I saw Ben and Jerry's out in the uh, corridor out there. People have rituals involving ice cream, for example, where Ben and Jerry's becomes important to them, right? Uh, community, um, I, one of my clients is CrossFit. I don't know if we have any fanatic, I mean, CrossFit people in here, but uh, this is a, an, an organizing platform for a community that's very, very powerful. These are just two examples. Uh, I have an entire list of these. If you want to go to my website or email me and I'll give you that information later, I'd be happy to send that to you. But you need to, to think about how your products are going to resonate with people. One way we do it is by building a brand personality, like the Pillsbury Doughboy. And we know that we have to not only build one, but we have to keep changing it over time, right? Like Betty Crocker. So this is Betty Crocker from the very beginning all the way to the more current one, which is a little more Hispanic and was actually computer generated from a larger list of, of images. So you can see that they're trying to change with the times, but not lose that basic Betty Crocker uh, brand personality. Okay, so how can we cement these things together? How can we uh, take proactive steps to merge the product and the person? Well, a lot of times we talk about market segmentation. Let's take a big group of people, create a message and a product, send it out to them, and since they're all fairly similar, like they're all male or female, they're all gonna respond the same. And uh, I think that today, in a so-called markets of one society, market segmentation as we know it really doesn't work very more because putting people into these big categories is very counterproductive. So as I like to say, there's two kinds of people in this world. People who think there are two kinds of people and people who don't, all right? So we have what's called a positivist tradition in science and uh, 
basically, it's a, it's, the goal is to put everybody into convenient categories. We love to categorize people and especially putting them into quadrants and then think we know them, right? Uh, so even in fashion, you know, maybe, maybe we have a drive to put people and products into categories. So for those of you who work in fashion, you know, as an example, that there are seasons. So we have categories. We, you know, this, this is spring, this is summer, this is ready to wear, this is not, etc. That is very, very limiting. So for example, if we break out of the box and we say, let's forget about those traditional categories and merge them together, here's a success story many of you know about, right? Athleisure, which is a combination of athletic wear, the traditional category, and leisure wear, one of the few success stories in the fashion business right now. So that brings me to postmodernism, <laughs> which means essentially the breaking down of these traditional categories. That's the part of it anyway that, that I want to focus on. And postmodernism basically says there's no such thing as categories, all truth is relative. We have to think about the consumer's lived experience, not just what category they belong to. So everybody knows what that means, right? It's Latin for there's no accounting for taste. Good at cocktail parties to know that. OK, so when we use these stale categories, we block the path to resonance. We don't want to do that. We want to try to break out of that. Um, Give you a warning, I'm about to plug my new book. Everybody ready? Okay, so I just published a book which is on this particular topic um, where I talk about various walls that marketers traditionally use um, and how we, those are obsolete. And I, I just want to mention a couple of them that I think are very relevant to you guys um, in the five minutes or so that I have left. So uh, the first one is we have this distinction, male versus female, obsolete. Right, changing very quickly. So we have this gender fluidity that we're seeing. Uh, in Asia, a large percentage of people already are living androgynous lifestyles. In England, uh, Selfridge's department store has an entire section of genderless clothing designers that it, that it carries. American Girl just came out with a boy doll, go figure. Uh, in, in a couple of states, maybe more by now, California and Oregon, when you, on your driver's license, you don't have to specify male or female anymore. There's a non-binary option. So clearly, and, and we're seeing uh, the, the whole transgender conversation that's going on with models that are breaking into that business. Um, and we're seeing, therefore, uh, androgynous-oriented companies that are succeeding, like this underwear company that makes underwear for men and women. Um, and we have these profound questions like, should men wear bracelets or, you know, or man bags? In other words, there are new opportunities for products when you break down some of those traditional barriers. The second one that I want to talk about is offline versus online. To a dinosaur like me, I, I like to go online, but I'm conscious that I'm going online and then going offline. Young people today are moving online and offline all day long hundreds of times a day. So that distinction no longer makes any sense. So this digital dichotomy is really obsolete and that's very important for us. So it's not just that people are fleeing to an online world where they're happier and more attractive. Important things are going on in that online world. So we know that people are digitizing their images, they're creating identities online. So uh, they're taking this image and now they're turning her into that before they put her in, into an ad. Uh, if you went to the eHarmony talk this morning, you know, I wanted to ask, people are putting their dating images up there. You know, guy, I might be describing myself kind of like that, but you know, I'm really that, right? Uh, but online you can be anything, right? And then we have that integration that's going on where uh, we have, for example, augmented reality. And everybody knows what that is by now, right? Because of Pokemon Go. <laughs> uh, so it's the marriage of digital and physical reality, which is just gonna become really huge. And for marketers, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you can do when you hold up your phone and you can see the truth about people and you know where they bought that shirt instead of having to ask them and all kinds of stuff like that. So, uh, so that's another one. And, and then finally, the user versus the designer. So that's a very relevant one for you guys. 
And, uh, and here we, we could talk about user-generated content. So we know that consumers are creating an enormous amount of content out there, like the very successful Doritos campaign, uh, creating your own commercial. We have the sharing economy where consumers are becoming taxi drivers and many other things. Um, in the design world, we let consumers, you know, give them the keys to the asylum and they can do all kinds of things with the nice logos that you guys make, you know. Uh, they're very creative. So you don't own your brand anymore. You know, get over it. People are using these brands in ways that you probably never envisioned. Um, people are personalizing products and that increases engagement. The IKEA effect, so-called, when we help to build something, we value it more. Uh, people are posting haul videos where they're showing proudly what they bought and they become part of the process again. Uh, just Google haul videos if you're not familiar with that term. You'll see many of them. Uh, and then the final one is, uh, that I want to talk about today anyway is the line between our physical body and the possessions that surround our bodies. Very important for designers. So we know that the body is a work in progress. We know that people are getting all kinds of enhancements done to their bodies all the time and tattoos and piercings and things like that. So we even have the first animated tattoo, uh, where you put your iPhone over, over his drawing and it actually brings up an animation. So that's, uh, that's a great example of what I'm talking about. We have so-called do-it-yourself biology, where these biohackers are creating various devices, um, excuse, oops, like, uh, like this, where they're monitoring blood pressure and stuff by inserting stuff into their bodies. So that, that line between the body and possessions is rapidly going away. We're becoming uh, walking billboards, walking you know, campaign posters for different causes, wearable technology is changing the way we think about our bodies. Uh, a hoodie that rings, that, that is actually a telephone that ring that vibrates depending on, differently depending on who's calling, things like that. Uh, Another profound question, what is a watch? That's a good one for designers. What is a watch? Is it jewelry like that or is it a tool? The design industry, the people who work in the accessories area are losing a lot of sleep about this because it has a lot of ramifications for the way they merchandise. So do we sell a watch as a fitness tool or do we sell it as a piece of jewelry? Where in the store do we put it? How do we advertise it, et cetera? So, uh, just, just to finish up, um, what are some of the ways that we can get into consumers' mind and understand their lived experience? And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but uh, just to give you a few examples, um, this is something that, that has been done for 30 or 40 years, just getting consumers to draw a picture or something like that of the typical consumer of a certain brand. So this is Pillsbury versus Duncan Hines. You can see on the, on the right-hand side one, we have what I call the Cosmo uh, uh, bake, cake baker you know, versus, versus the home, frumpy homemaker. We can learn a lot by various kinds of qualitative research, of course. Um, we can go, uh, the Japanese have a term called going to the gemba, which means the place where the item is consumed, where the experience happens. Don't sit in your office trying to imagine how consumers are using your product. Go there. So for example, uh, this was a project that was done by the people who run uh, uh, concessions at airports like cafeterias. And they, they actually sent their people out to basically, you call it journey mapping, I think, basically to see what happens. So for example, we've all had this moment when we're traveling alone, you put your bags down to go get your food, and now you can't see your bags and you freak out, right? So that's a design flaw that they can only identify when they actually go to the Gemba. Uh, this was a project that I worked on for Black & Decker, uh, the Scum Buster. People liked it, but it turns out the engineers never thought that, that the user would want, they used to make it so that they had to carry a, a, uh, a container filled with cleaning fluid and then squirt the Scum Buster. When we followed Housewives around, we found out that by adding that little reservoir in there, and eliminating that, satisfaction went up and sales went through the roof for that product. Just a small design change that can only be discovered through observation. Okay, so basically to sum up, 
We want to, uh, we want to try to link to higher order needs to break through that clutter, and that is going to be the path to engagement. So uh, I think my time is about up. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't try to hawk my new book. So if you give me your business card or email me, I'll send you a coupon for a massive 70% discount. Only good today. Um, uh, just email me and uh, be happy to, to do that. And otherwise, I thank you very much. And I don't know if we have time for questions or probably not. Probably not yeah. Okay. Thank you all. See you at the reception.